Let's take you to this now. The British Embassy has issued a terrorism alert for its citizens who are traveling to South Africa. Now, according to this alert, terrorists are very likely to try to carry out attacks in South Africa. According to media reports, the Department of International Relations has rubbished the alert, calling it unfounded with no evidence. In October last year, you will recall, of course, the U.S. issued a similar warning alert that terrorist attacks might take place in Santon. Now, for the very latest on this and other issues on the international space, we're now joined in studio by SABC International News Editor Sophie Mugwena. Sophie, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. Let's then start with, I mean, I want to talk to you about a range of issues, but let's start with this latest terror attack. I mean, you, of course, know that we are in an election year. One would probably not want to be dealing with this kind of threat. But just talk to us about what this means and, interestingly, the response by Durka. Well, clearly, this is an alert from the Foreign Office of the United Kingdom. You know that uh, in most cases, the foreign missions do issue such alerts if they have information. And therefore, this is something that has been circulating from the uh, Foreign Office of uh, the United Kingdom. But as you pointed out, DERCO has requested the United Kingdom to issue more information or give their more information so that they can share with intelligence and security. But the question is, is this uh, directed at uh, the coming elections in terms of, uh, you know that when there are elections, you often receive such information. Mm -hmm. A case in point, that's what happened in Russia just before the elections. It didn't happen at that time, it did happen thereafter. And we know that uh, the Americans had issued information to warn the uh, Russians about this, but they didn't uh, uh, believe it. But it then happened now. I think South Africa, in this case, requesting more information. They are already doing their own research in terms of intelligence. I've spoken a few minutes ago with the office of the president. You know that uh, Dr. Naledi Pando is traveling with President mm -hmm. Ramaphosa in South Sudan, asking that uh, the minister uh, respond to these allegations or this report or maybe this information. And we're looking uh, forward to perhaps get a, 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 a video link or a video recorded message from the minister talking about this. But this is something that you can't take light. But at the same time, uh, you can't uh, make the whole nation to panic, particularly you, ahead of elections. No, you're absolutely right. And I mean, just talking on your point, it wasn't an election year, but we know, of course, that the U.S. Um, had also warned um, Israel of a, a possible attack by Hamas. Now, staying with the Middle East, um, I want to talk about the United Nations Security Council's meeting tomorrow. Of course, this is an important one. It will be talking about issues in the Middle East, but also the Palestinian a question. There is, of course, a question of can Palestine join the UN as a, a permanent member? Just talk to us about that meeting. This meeting is supposed to happen today, but we know yesterday there were attempts mm. to push the meeting to Friday. Now the information is that this meeting will get underway at 4 p.m. South African time with statements. We know that it is at the ministerial level. It's not just the diplomats of the respective countries within the Security Council, the 15 countries and the two affected countries, but the foreign affairs ministers. Mm -hmm. We saw a few hours ago the foreign affairs minister of Iran arriving in New York and therefore, clearly, this is a high-level meeting. It's going to start at 4 with the Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, making the statements, and the 15 member countries will weigh in. Mm -hmm. And then later, the two countries that are affected, Israel and Iran, will also talk about uh, their views. And also Palestine, because the main meeting is around a request by Palestine to be accepted as a full member of the United Nations. As you know that currently Palestine has got observer status mm. and therefore they want to be a full member. And we know that uh, it is a contested matter. The United States of America is expected to veto this request because at this moment with all the tension in the Middle East, I think they are going to use 
the current tension in the Middle East to try and please uh, Israel because they are trying to persuade mm. Israel behind the scenes not to attack Iran. And these are some of the trade-offs that are likely going to play uh, themselves in the discussions by different countries as they try to navigate the issue of the Middle East, particularly on the backdrop of the attack by Iran. Mm, and I want us to talk very briefly about Iran. I mean, um, of course, we know, as you say, um, that, you know, there are talks behind the scenes trying to see if there can be a peace solution to this uh, imminent uh, retaliation by Iran. Let's talk now about the EU sanctions that have been ramped up against Iran. Will they in any way, you know, uh, prevent a larger scale um, retaliation from Iran? These are Israel allies trying to manage the situation because the fear is that if Israel does retaliate, Iran has already issued a statement that they will double what they did uh, weekend. And we know that Iran has got strong military capability and their sanctions, particularly targeting the drones, you know that Iran is one country that is manufacturing these drones. Mm -hmm. We know that even in relation to the war in Ukraine, uh, there were reports that some of the drones that are being used there uh, are being uh, imported from Iran. And therefore, it has got a very powerful uh, arms industry. We know that uh, in recent days, the problem we have around the globe it is the arms industry. And therefore, a country such as Iran, who were isolated, had ample time to capacitate themselves, including, the, we are told, the nuclear capability. You know that America uh, was in talks with Iran to try and persuade Iran not to continue with its nuclear program. And therefore, it is not a country that you can undermine. And therefore, the sanctions are aimed at stifling Iran. But we are told that uh, uh, what Iran has done in recent time, they've sold a lot of oil mm. to countries such as China. So they are sitting pretty well. Whether you, you, you impose sanctions, they will manage. And secondly, they are members of the BRICS uh, countries and some BRICS member countries will continue to do business with Iran, particularly a country such as Russia that is also experiencing a similar issue. You had uh, the Secretary of Treasury of the United States of America, Janet Yellen, talking about strengthening the sanctions against Iran and also Russia even uh, seizing assets of uh, Russia and as we speak, we expect the finance ministers of uh, G7 countries to meet on the margins of the spring meeting of uh, IMF and World Bank in Washington. Of course, we will give our viewers, you know, um, developments in as far as what transpires in that meeting. But thanks so much for that analysis. And finally, as we wrap up our conversation, just looking at what's happening globally, I want to talk about what is being earmarked as the largest and possibly the longest election that will be running in India. Of course, a lot of moving parts here in this particular uh, election as the incumbent, obviously, uh, also enjoying this uh, large scale um, um, you know, uh, approval ratings of 80% we are hearing. But just unpack what we can lightly expect uh, um, tomorrow when India goes to the polls. Well, we expect uh, many people in India to endorse uh, the current uh, Prime Minister uh, Modi. You know that he worked very hard to entrench himself. Mm. And that is why when you look at the polls, he's quite popular. The G20 meeting that he hosted in India last year, again there, entrenching himself at the global scale. And also being a member of BRICS, he's got also good relations with the United States of America. And in relation to the current standoff in the Middle East mm. and in Russia, taking a neutral position, not agreeing to be uh, dictated to, depending on the interest of India. 
So, but there's strong view that he has uh, clamped down on opposition. We had uh, the major opposition party who is in this case even a friend to the African National Congress in South Africa uh, complaining. So I think uh, after two months, we will see uh, him coming back. You know that uh, this is a logistical nightmare, yeah. many people, and also it will take two months to conclude the election. So by the time we receive the results in South Africa for our elections, they would have just received their results or it might be simultaneously. So 60 countries around the world go into the polls, almost two thirds of the population of the world going to the polls. It is a massive, massive elections. We're still waiting for the United States of America on, on the continent. And we have Ghana, you have Namibia, you have Botswana, but there are other many, many, many countries that are going to elections. Interesting. And of course, that explains why uh, certain leaders like Modi are remaining neutral in as far as uh, many, um, mm. you know, uh, critical um, agenda items are concerned. Including South including Sudan, in, uh, where the president yeah, is right Turkey, now. Yeah. He's flying back today. And we know that the purpose there was to mediate mm. between uh, Rick Machat and also Salva Kiir because they must go to elections. Mm. And the other side is saying the country is not ready. The other side is saying the country is ready. And there's that tension. And South Africa was appointed by the AU to help Sudan to go to elections and bring peace in that country. You know that South Africa played a very important role in, uh, during the process of cessation. And this uh, newest state, mm. uh, a baby of South Africa, and South Africa babysitting South Sudan for quite a long time.